Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole wide world to Open Door Church on a big time Sunday morning? Boom. Hey. Good. Well, welcome, my friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome. One of the great privileges that I have at the beginning of the year is to sit down and map out my sermon series and the things that I believe that God would have me bring to his church as I do everything I can do to, to lead and to feed his people, and I'm one of his people as well. And I knew, I've known for a long time that I was going to start this sermon series that it's going to be on the end times, it's going to be on prophecy, it's going to be on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's going to be called The Wedding and the War, and I'm beginning it, I'm, I'm starting this today. Today's sermon series, or I should say today's message, is one of a lot of messages that I'm going to be teaching probably for the next six weeks at least on the return of Jesus, on the zeal of the Lord, on how judgment works on the importance of being all fired up about the return of the king, on what does it mean to be an end-time church, what is our role, what should we expect, what should we be hoping for, and this is going to be going on for at least the next six weeks. But today's message, number one, is called I Ain't Scared. Tell the person next to you, just tell them, say, I ain't scared. I was in San Diego here a few years ago. I like San Diego, and I was in San Diego, and... California is a really neat place to me. I, I love how extreme California is. And Leanne and I were there, and there happened to be a young man who was in the Marines, and he was, he was stationed there in training. And uh, he was from Joshua, and he was one of our kids here from, from our church. And so knowing that he was there, I contacted him and said, hey, man, you want to get together and have lunch? He's like, yes, I would love to. So we got together, and we had lunch. And I was expecting, with him being a young man, I was expecting to spend the whole two-hour conversation with just letting him tell me whatever he wanted to tell me and talk to me about whatever he wanted to talk about, which I was sure was going to be about him because it was the place in life where he was at, but it didn't go like that at all. All he wanted to do was drill me and ask me what it's like to be me. And honestly, I don't think that I have ever had that conversation with anybody where you, you go to lunch with somebody or sit down with somebody and because, you know, there's a lot of business that goes on when you sit down with the pastor. Hey, I need to ask you this. Or I need to talk to you about this. or I've got this issue. And that's fine. I promise it is fine. But I had never sit down and they said, just tell me about you. What's your job like? And I'm like, really? He said, yeah. And it, and it just kind of shocked me. You know, he was like, how come you became a pastor? And what's it like to be a pastor? And is it different being a pastor now than when it, whenever it first started? And I was like, okay. And so I started talking to him about stuff, about, well, what does it mean to be a pastor? And, you know, there's lots of different ideas of what that could be. And I started talking to him about, well, I got lots of responsibilities. I have to be a man of prayer. We, we were talking about the supernatural side of it. I got to be a man of prayer. And I got to be dedicated to a life of contemplation and bound and determined to thank God thoughts. And, and since I'm a teaching pastor, I got to be, I got to have a willingness to grow in how I communicate the gospel and how I think about the gospel and how I learn. And then I got to think, and now that really doesn't have anything to do with me being a pastor. That's just being a Christian. Like, that's all of us. And I went, you know, no, I'm actually not telling you right. You know, I'm really not. Yes, I have to have a, a willingness and a responsibility to continue to learn. But by the way, so do you. And I'm not, I don't do those things because I'm a pastor. I do those things because I'm walking with King Jesus, and that's a part of my walk. So then after I had come to that conclusion, I said, actually, those things are not my job at all. That's just part of living a walk and living the life I get to live, and it's the same for you. So he said, so, so what is your responsibility then as a pastor? And I told him, I said, you know, my main responsibility is not to do weddings and funerals and hospital visits and personal counseling. I like to do those things, but with, with a growing congregation, it's very limited as to how much I can of those things do. That's why we have to have a staff that's able to do that. And we do. we got a great staff that's able to do that. But you know what? I have to be a team, I have to be a team builder, and I have to stay very connected to my team members and pour into their lives because the Bible says in Psalms chapter 68, verse 11, that the Lord gave the word and great was the company that published it. It's one thing for God Almighty to give the word. It's another thing for a, for a body to take on the cause of transforming the region into what God Almighty says that it ought to be. And so I said, you know, one of the great ways that my job has changed throughout the years as a pastor is instead of being the guy who does everything, I'm the guy who helps everybody who does everything. 
And I'm the guy that tries to connect people, and I'm the guy that makes sure that it's very clear and it's very defined as to who we are as a church, and this is what we believe, and this is, this is what we're going after, and we we're not going to stop. How many of y'all believe that as, as long as Troy Brewer is running this show that we're not going to stop? Do you guys actually believe that? Because I want to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I don't have a lot of money, but I got faithfulness. And I learned that a long, long, long time ago. Since, since, since I'm not very smart and since I don't have a lot of means, I had better have something that is a wow. And let me tell you what every single one of us in this room can have that can be a wow, and it's just be faithful. Do not bail. Do not quit. Do not slow down. Do not stop. Amen. No, I can do this. If, if I don't have anything else to offer, I've always got faithfulness to offer. Somebody say amen to that. Well, I have to, I, my main responsibility is to be the chief architect of the culture of the house. And I want to say that again. My main responsibility is to be the chief culture or the chief architect of the culture of the house, which means I'm the guy that's held responsible for making sure that our church looks a whole lot more like heaven than it, than it looks like hell. Amen. And whenever the pastor does not do that, the meanest and most disruptive people within the house are happy to do that. They are happy to define, this is what we're going to make a big deal out of. Nobody in this church gets to decide what it is that we're going to make a big deal out of. I'm the guy who decides that. Now, you're the guy who decides if this church is right for you. Amen. And that's a huge responsibility that, that you have. But I take, I take this position so seriously. Like, cause, cause, because what's real, is, what's real is God isn't going to hold you responsible for the direction of this church. God isn't going to hold you responsible and ask you, let me ask you about your church. You know what? Uh, did, you, did you guys choose to be a relational church or not? God's not going to ask you that. God Almighty is not going to, not, God Almighty is not going to judge you according to if this church took care of the poor or not. God Almighty is not going to judge you according to did you take on the very real responsibility of kicking poverty in the teeth as a body. He's not going to judge you according to that. Now, he might judge you according to that individually, but whenever it comes to this body, I'm the one that he says, Troy, you had better take this serious. And I do. Now, look, I don't take myself seriously at all, okay? But I take this role extremely seriously. And guys, one of the things that I can tell you about this church is that we're going to be a church that will stand with Israel. We're going to be a church that will stand with the poor. We're going to be a church that is a supernatural church that goes after signs, miracles, and wonders, right? We are going to be a church that loves Jesus. We are going to be a church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ and says, you must be born again. Okay, I could go on and on and on and on and on and tell you this. That's my main job, is to make sure that we are that kind of a church, to be the chief architect of the culture of the house. And here's how you define a culture. You define a culture by what you make a big deal out of. And it's the, the, the hoity-toity or posh word for that is values. You define a culture by what you value. Whether it's a police union or a motorcycle gang, what unites everybody is what they make a big deal out of. So for me, when it comes to my staff, and when it comes to the pastors and when it comes to the congregation, my main responsibility is to make sure that our church looks like, acts like, and demonstrates heaven instead of demonstrating hell. Now, there's a lot of pastors who do not take that serious at all. What they take serious is preaching out of the Bible, and then they turn what I just described to you over to the board. And when they turn it over to the board, they're not turning it over to the board. They're turning it over to the biggest personality on the board. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to leave it up to anybody else because I believe with all my heart that God Almighty holds me responsible for this. I think it's really important for every single one of us to have a very sobering heart check on what are the things that God's holding me responsible for. Do we believe in the kindness of God? Of course. Do we believe in the goodness of God? Of course. Do we believe in the grace of God? Of course. But do we believe that God will absolutely hold us responsible for certain things and say, I'm not playing with you. You'd better get this right. Do we believe that, church? Okay. Well, listen, I believe that. And as much as I believe in eternity, I also believe that our lives are incredibly short. I do. And I think that there are just some things 
that you just need to be bound and determined, dude, I'm going to get this thing right, and I'm not going to spend 20 years of my life spinning my wheels anymore. This thing here, I've got to get right. Somebody say amen to that. Well, one of the things, guys, that we have to get right is that we have to be a kind of a people who not only believe that Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead, but we need to be the kind of people who absolutely believe that Jesus Christ is coming back again. And there's a, there's a large population within the body of Christ that says it's not really necessary to really believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. I mean, come on. I mean, we don't have to believe that. We can still be Christians. No, that is a different kind of gospel. Like, well, you can't define that. Yes, I can. I can let Jesus define it. And I can let my definition be as how Jesus defines and go, That's, this is what this is going to be. Well, the same exact group of people who also say it's no big deal. You don't have to believe in the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ, which you had better. There is no hope. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, it, this is all a waste of time. This is ridiculous. He was a poor Jew. Why would you follow him if he did not resurrect from the dead? Because he's cool? Well, there's cool people everywhere. Listen, you're following him because he is God Almighty in the flesh. That's why you're following him. And he came as a son to put a face on the Father so that we don't have to guess what God looks like. We don't have to worry about what is God's ultimate agenda. What's he really like? What's, what's, what, what is the heart of the Father all about? And what, is, what, what is all that? And he shows up and says, I will plainly show you. And he did that for us. Now, he did resurrect from the dead. And this is what he said. I'm coming back. Now, this is not some pie in the sky kind of theology whenever we're talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something that is so important when it comes to the church, that we be the kind of church that actually believes that Jesus is coming back. Because I want to tell you something. There's a big difference, big difference in a Christianity that says, I'm not really sure if Jesus is coming back, and a Christianity that says, I know of a certain that Jesus is coming back. And your priorities are different, and you know what? How the power of God flows through you is completely different. Friends, I have to tell you that we are a prophetic church who believes in and looks forward to the glorious and the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are not going to give that up. Somebody, somebody give the Lord a great big praise. Amen. Listen, we are not going to give that up. Well, the culture doesn't like it. Rain on the culture. Well, it's not taught anymore. Well, I'm sorry that people are afraid, that people are afraid to teach this. Friends, the position of our heart towards things matters in the kingdom, and it qualifies us for certain things. The position of our heart does. What you're passionate about and what you actually engage in matters. Jesus says, I see those things. Even at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, he says, there is a blessing in those that read this book and keep it. In other words, you qualify for something in being somebody who looks for the return of Jesus Christ. You also qualify for something that you do not want if you do not believe in it. There's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of people that don't understand the importance of qualification within the kingdom. And the reason why we don't understand that is because we think everything that the Bible talks about is about us getting saved. Okay, here's what the Bible says. Get saved. Then once you're saved, there is a whole lifetime of discovery of how to walk with God and how to apply the kingdom to your life. Nobody qualifies for salvation except for Jesus Christ. Amen? So because we understand that, we don't understand many times because, because we're children, we're babes, as the Bible says, and because, and because we're on the milk of the, of, the, of the Word of God, we don't understand that once we do get saved, man, you qualify for the favor of God. Not the grace of God, but the favor of God, right? There's certain things that you actually, that if you walk in, God Almighty says, I will reward you actually in this life and in the life to come. One of the big things, guys, that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about during this sermon series is the power of reward and how God Almighty says, listen, this is a big deal. Like, well, I really don't need any rewards because that's just going to, po oh, no, 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 listen. The kind of rewards that God Almighty gives you affects everybody else around you. Yeah. Amen. And friends, you need to be rewarded. 
And you, there needs to be some tests that you actually pass and some faithfulness that you actually walk in long enough to where God Almighty can say, let me reward you in a way that glorifies me, says the Lord. Let me show everybody how happy I am with you. Let me show everybody how much I love you. Let me do that. It's, it's one of the, it's one of the, the, the principle, uh, what's one of the, the, the foundational principles of heaven and for, the new, and for the age to come is how we are rewarded. But again, people are still worried about, well, I'm not sure I'm saved. Okay, you need to either get saved or get away from the rest of us. Because you're bipolar. And, and you are a train wreck, is, is what you are. I'm saved, I'm not saved. God loves me, God's mad at me. I don't really understand anything. My God, listen, hear me say this. Hear me say this. It is so important for us to confess our sin before, Lord, b- b- before the Lord Jesus Christ, put our faith upon the Lord Jesus Christ, get saved, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then move on. Move on. Start working on the fruits of the Holy Ghost within, within your life. Man, and, and take up a kingdom cause and start building heaven upon this earth. Amen. So important for us to become prophetic people and, us, and for us to be the kind of people that, that, that we, become, we become skilled in the things of God. I mean, you're never going to do that if you're like, I'm only saved as long as I feel good about myself. King Jesus, be delivered from that. Be set free from that. Some religious devil got in your life and told you, you're not worthy and you're not this, you're not that. You're not worthy, but Jesus is. And Jesus has given you all that he has so that you do not have to be ashamed. Praise the Lord. Well, one of the things that people, people will say when it comes to studying about the end times is I really don't want to know anything about that because I don't want to learn about the end times just because it's just too scary to contemplate. Okay, I'm going to call you a wambulance. <laughs> I'm going to call you a wambulance, and we're going to find a special group of people that's going to hold your hand and tell you it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Now, again, you'll be worthless, and you'll be saved, but you're going to be a baby that's going to have to be patted on your little honey for the rest of your life because, you know, things are just scary, and you just don't want to have to deal with anything that's scary. Get up! Quit it! It's the, same, it's the same reason why people are not in the business of helping save 8 million people in, in slavery today. Oh, I'm so mad about slavery in America 200 years ago. What a liar. You won't do nothing about the 8 million slaves today, and you're going to tell me you're passionate about slavery from 200 years ago? What a hypocrite. What a liar. Get up and do something. Well, but it's scary. People won't even go, hey, Pastor Roy, I'd like to go on a mission trip, but it's too, just too scary. Wah. God help us if that's the kind of Christians that we are, that we're, we're just like, I'm sorry, I just can't deal with things that are scary. In fact, I just, forgive me, but I just got to be on Prozac 24-7 because I'm scared of things. Look, I want to just tell you, that's the reason why our country is going to hell. That's, that, that is the reason why there's so much hell in this world, not because God is evil, but because the people of God are not spreading the goodness of God, because we're scared. Pastor Troy, don't you ever get scared? Oh, listen, this brother right here gets some fearsome scared, I promise you. Like what you just said, no, 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 listen, I want to tell you something. Man, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is getting up and doing it anyway. I get scared all the time of all kinds of things. But how many of you guys know that I have an actual horrible phobia of flying? Do you guys know that? I mean, have any of you guys ever been flying with me and I just started bawling and squalling for no reason? <laughs> I do. It's horrible. And uh, there's probably not very many people in this room that fly more than I do. My, my gut, my, my stomach literally hurts all the time because I fly. And because it physically hurts me to fly, I'm so scared in an airplane. No, I didn't tell you I, I, didn't tell you I, I never experienced fear. What I said is, I'm, I'm not going to let fear shut me down. God's called me to be a missionary. And, and you can't drive to Africa. <laughs> Friends, I want to just tell you that if, if, you're, if you're 
thinking about the end times or if you're thinking about the return of the Lord Jesus is not a hopeful kind of thinking. It's under the influence of a lie. One of the, one of the reasons why I'm able, in the, in, in the few places that I'm able to take on courage, one of the reasons why I am is because I'm so hopeful. Hope will cause you to get up. And people who do not have hope in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ are sitting on their butts griping about other people. Man, I'm preaching mean today. I'm going to be a lot nicer in the second service. I'm just telling you. I won't, <laughs> if, if, I was, if I was too mean for y'all in the first service, I'm sorry. You just stay for the second. I'll be a lot nicer. You'll see. No, man, what's real is, man, hope is an incredible motivator. Hope Hope will cause you to have mercy on people that you don't even like. One of the reasons why there's so little mercy in the body of Christ is because there's so little hope. You know, somebody shows up, they don't live the way that you think they ought to live or whatever, so you just tell them. You have no hope for their their transformation whatsoever. You have no hope for God Almighty doing something amazing within their life. You have no hope for there being a powerful breakthrough. So you just tell them how you don't agree with their life. As if, if, you know, you think they're going to care if you agree with them or not. Amen? I say, well, that's my job. My role is to point out what I don't agree with. Really? No, it's not. It's really, truly not. Any part of your life that doesn't have great hope is under the influence of a lie. Amen? Anytime God Almighty is speaking into your life, he'll start talking about hope. And I want to just tell you, when it comes to the end times and when it comes to the return of the Lord Jesus, if you're not hopeful, um, you just don't have it right. So, well, I understand. Wait, okay. This is how most of the body of Christ preaches the return of Jesus. It's going to get really bad. It's going to get really horrible. Lots of people are going to die. Yay! Wow, there's our, there's our blessed hope that it's just going to be worse than it's ever been and Jesus is going to come back and kill a whole bunch of folk. Like, well, where is the hope in that? Well, exactly, where is the hope in that? See, I, I want to just tell you, I'm not saying that times are not going to get bad because they are. And I'm also not saying that the zeal of the Lord is not going to show up and defend me and you and the body of Christ in Israel, because he will. But I'm also just telling you this, that the hope is this. See, guys, when Jesus shows up again, he's not going to show up as a six-pound baby Jew like he did the first time. He's going to show up as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's going to have it tatted out on his thigh in a way that nobody can ever remove that title. And he's going to show up with a sword in his hand and he's going to say, I have had restraint for 6,000 years of human history. I have had restraint and I will no longer have any restraint. And guys, when he comes back, he is going to set up his throne that right now is in heaven on this earth. And he's going to tell all of humanity, you had your chance. Now you're going to have to do it my way. And what is his way? Well, in the age to come, the world is much, much, much different than the world is now. And when I say it's better, (laughs) that does not begin to describe. See, I want you to think about any time that Jesus has showed up in your life. He shows up to heal. He shows up to make a way. He shows up to redeem. I mean, our hope all the time, the Bible says that Christ in you is the hope of glory, right? So what does that mean? It means this: since I'm a carrier of the hidden presence of God, he's liable to just be made manifest anytime, anywhere. Christ in me is the hope of glory. I mean, I could go, I can go to the dadgum movies and be sitting in there eating popcorn and because I carry the presence of the Lord, all of a sudden God just might break out in the dadgum movie house. Christ in me is the hope of glory. Right on? Because I carry the presence of Jesus with me, God's liable to bust out uh, at the family dinner table sometimes. God Almighty's liable to, see, Christ in me is the hope of glory. So what is the hope of glory means literally the hope that we have that God can be made manifest in anything. That the thing that's messed up can be made right because God shows up. Right? 
Okay, well, you do that on steroids, and that's the return of King Jesus. It's the return of the Lord. I hear people say, I don't want to learn about the end times because it's, it's way too scary to contemplate. Well, I say this, you don't have that luxury. You are a part of the end time church, whether you want to be or not. And the hope that you have is not in more money. The hope that you have is in Jesus Christ. What other hope could we possibly have? You know, the challenge that I have for Darren, for, that I have for you during this teaching is to absolutely convince you that these are the last days and the last times and that it is a great privilege to live in this day. It's an incredible privilege. When you study history the way that I study history, one of the things that I'm constantly thinking is, thank God I live in the day that I live in, right now, this day. Well, Pastor Troy, I pine for the good old days. Well, that's because you're religious. And religion is always about the way things used to be, which is why you fight for things that no longer matter. Right? Friends, we need to fight the right battles. And the right battles that we need to fight, are, are, they are today tomorrows, and they are today battles, they are tomorrow battles, they are not yesterday battles. Friends, when we fight for the things that used to be, we fight for the things that no longer matter. So what are the things that matter today? Paul wrote this, he said in Romans chapter 13, he says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than ever we first believed. Friends, I'm going to close on this and I'm just going to just say this. There is a sobering reality and if, and if, and if, you've, been, if you've been with me for, for very long, if you have, you know that I'm somebody who teaches the grace of Jesus. I'm somebody who, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a laughter freak. Um, I'm funny, whether, whether you think I am or not, I'm convinced I'm funny. There's, I, I, there, I, I'm, I'm going to have fun. I, I'm, I, I'm not going to take myself very seriously. I love irreverent humor. I love that. I, I love all those kinds of things. And I have a lot of grace for people. But at the same exact time, know this. Guys, we, it needs to be okay with us when Jesus tells us, you need to be very sober-minded about some things. And one of the things that we need to be sober-minded about is the day that we actually live in, this day. Now, when I look around this room and I see all these people, I don't know who's going to go to whose funeral first. I don't have any idea. I don't know if you guys are going to end up coming to my funeral or if I'm going to end up going to your funeral. But however much time that I have left and however much time that you have left, We're not going to live it as if we do not believe that Jesus is coming back at any given moment. We're not going to live it as if we do not understand that our lives are important and matter in the grand scheme of things of kingdom and Jesus is watching. The eye of the Lord is actually upon us and he sees the choices that we make for him. You know, God Almighty is not going to judge you according to how many stadiums you fill. God Almighty is going to judge you according to the heart decisions that you make. And those are little bitty tiny things that you do all throughout the day, constantly. Wherever there is selflessness within your life, the eye of the Lord is upon you for those things. When you begin to understand and contemplate the return of the Lord Jesus and that he is a rewarder of those who have patiently served him, you also begin to recognize every single part of your life in serving him matters. Matters. 